Welcome to another video. Let's do another Epsilon Delta proof, but this time for a square root function. And let me tell you something funny. An idea came into my head while I was preparing for this. I thought, what if this was an exam and I get frustrated because I don't know how to prove this because it's not a linear function, it's not a quadratic function. Can I just square both sides? Because if I square both sides, I'm going to have the limit of, am I supposed to square the limit? Because this is going to turn out to be just x and this is going to be 4 and then I can treat it as a linear function and then I can prove it. I know that's not going to work, but who knows? But we're not going to do that. We're just going to use the typical definition and then find a good delta and solve our problem. Let's get into the video. As good practice, it is always um, recommended that you know how to state the definition of a limit. And it is not difficult. All you have to say is, I'm going to write it in shorthand form. You have to say, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that this is just it for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that if x minus four is less than delta let's put zero here yeah if zero is less than x minus four and it's less than delta, then the function, the square root of x minus two is less than epsilon. This is all you need to be able to state. I just stated it using what we have, okay? So this is the shorthand form of the proof. We just need to show that if we can establish that this is less than delta, then we know that the square root of x minus 2 has to be less than epsilon. And that is the proof that this is the limit. Okay, so how do we start? I want you to see what we really, really need. We need x minus 4 being less than delta. You have to do all you can to generate x minus 4 from whatever algebraic ex expressions you're using. If you can't find x minus 4, it becomes a problem unless you use other strategies in advanced calculus. But I want to treat this as if you're still doing calculus 1 where this topic is relevant. Okay, so how do we start? Generally, you would start, I always say, you should always start from this as if you're going in the opposite direction. So let's start the proof. Let's do it here. Proof. You're going to start from this part of the proof, trying to find a delta. Remember we said for every epsilon, there exists a delta. We want to show that there exists a delta greater than zero. That's what we want to show. So we're going to say, okay, Let's deal with epsilon because we say for all epsilon greater than zero. So let's start from here and try to find a delta from here. Because once there exists a delta, then we're good. So here we go. We're going to say that the absolute value of the square root of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. But remember what we typically do, we try to generate this expression x minus 4, the absolute value of x minus 4 from here. How can we change this to x minus 4? Now what I'm about to show you is true every time you're dealing with the square root function. Every time, okay? Just know. Okay, let's do something here. Watch this. The square root of x as the square root of x minus 3 times the square root of x plus 3 divided by the square root of x 
plus three. This is what we call rationalization. But you see, the reason why I don't want to say it's rationalization is because it is not um, a rational expression. Okay, I did not write one over this, but what we're actually doing is rationalizing. So if you multiply any function, we do this a lot in limits, multiply a function by its conjugate and divide again by its conjugate, I mean a surge rather, by its conjugate and divide by its conjugate, what you've generated essentially, you see this is the same thing as this, you haven't changed anything, but if you notice, if you multiply the top together, you'll end up with x minus nine and the bottom still stays there square root of x plus three so what you do essentially whenever you have a square root function is just square the two terms and divide it by the conjugate so what we have here is actually this expression x minus four divided by Oh, we have absolute value here. Absolute value of x minus 4 divided by square root of x plus 2 is less than epsilon. I have rewritten the problem. This, you have to remember how to do this. It is always the square of this minus the square of this divided by the conjugate of this, which is just, you change the sign to a plus. That's what you have in here. Okay, this is the hardest part. Once we've gotten this, is this the hardest part? The second hardest part. Let's go to the hardest part. So remember that the mission is to isolate the absolute value of x minus four. So this expression can be written this way. This is the same thing as um, the absolute value of x minus four divided by the absolute value of square root of x plus two. How am I able to do this? I know this is always positive. The square root of x plus two is always positive. So I just shouldn't have a problem with whether it's inside the absolute value or it's not inside the absolute value because it will always be positive. So see, the way I can write this, I can say, let's write it this way, less than epsilon. So watch what I can do. I can actually say that this absolute value this is the same thing as um, the absolute value of x minus 4 multiplied by 1 over square root of x plus 2 is less than epsilon. So I'm going to treat this as if it's just a number. It doesn't need the absolute value bars anymore because it is always positive. I know that. Okay, now what do I need to do? This is what I want. I need this to be a number. Okay, I don't want it to depend on x. So I need it to be a number, but I have to be careful the number that I choose. Because if I choose any weird number, it's not going to fulfill the mission of looking for a delta that actually works. And when we say a delta, we're looking for a particular delta, okay, such that it will work. There exists a delta. For all epsilon, there exists a delta. Okay, so let's find a delta. Okay, now, usually we say that the absolute value of x minus 4 has to be less than delta. Now, it's reasonable when you do proofs to pick small numbers because your delta cannot be a million, cannot be a billion, cannot be a thousand. In fact, it should not be 10. In fact, it shouldn't be. Five, traditionally, we just say, let's delta be a unit, just one. Make it one or anything less than one makes sense. Okay, so what we do is we say, let's assume that this x minus four, you don't, x does not go too far away from four. So let x be within a unit of four. So we say, let the absolute value of x minus four this, let it be less than one. Okay? Why do we always choose less than one? It's because we want to make this distance, how far you go away from the target point, as small as possible. That's why we make this choice. So, what does this mean? We can easily write this as minus one 
is less than x minus 4, which is less than 1. Okay? We're trying to solve this. We're trying to look for a good value of x. What happens here, if we add 4 to each of these sections, if you add 4 to this, you're going to get 3. You add 4 to this, you get x. You add 4 to this, you're going to get 5. So, the values of x that are going to make this, this assumption that we just make, made work will be from 3 to 5. Okay? So, these are what we're going to use. Now, look. We don't want to make x to be equal to 4 because if we make x equal 4, then it's just going to make this trivial. Anything we're doing is going to be trivial. We're not at 4. x cannot be equal to 4. Let's actually make that clear from here. x is not equal to 4. So, in every case here, x is not equal to 4. So, well, we could choose this to be our delta. Do you know that? Because it satisfies this condition. Okay, we could just say, let delta be 1. But it's possible that delta is less than 1. I mean, that this number, delta is less than 1. So, we would actually pick a number that is either 1 or any number that is less than 1. So, let's try and figure out what is less than 1. Just watch this. So, now, the reason we're doing this is so we can go back and replace the square root of x here. We want to pick a particular value of x. So now, since I'm not picking 4, and I don't want to deal with decimals, okay, let me pick 3 or pick 5. Now, this is where students have asked me questions many times, and I've explained it to them. Listen to what I'm about to explain if this part is going to confuse you. I'm about to pick 3 or 5, but I want to go here. I am saying the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side. That's the claim that we started with. If you want to do a proof that something is less than, the left is less than the right, what you can do is increase the left. If you increase the left-hand side, and it is still less than the right-hand side. It means the original claim you made was actually true. I'm going to say that again. If I say that 4 is less than 6, this is true. But let's assume you did not know that 4 is less than 6. What I can do is, you know what? Just to prove a point, I'm going to add to the left-hand side. I'm going to add 1 to it. Or you say, this is 5. Oh, I know 5 is less than 6. Well, if you agree that 5 is less than 6, then the original 4, which was even smaller, must be less than 6. So that's what you do. So we're going to increase the left-hand side and still claim that it is less than epsilon. How do you increase the left-hand side? You make this number bigger. How would you make this number bigger? Which of these numbers if you use it to replace x, would make the number bigger. Is it 5 or 3? Remember, for a proper fraction, decreasing the denominator increases the value of the fraction. One third. If you want to make this a bigger number, change the 3 to 2. The same thing. If you want to make this fraction bigger, change this x Two, if you want to put a number here, should you pick 5 or pick 3? I would pick 3 because 3 is smaller and it makes this whole number, the entire fraction, bigger. And so we've increased the left-hand side. We're going to claim that it is still less than the right-hand side. So what am I going to do? Let x be equal to 3. So when you claim that x is equal to 3, you can go back to this fraction and say the absolute value of x minus 4 times 1 over the square root of 3 plus 2 is less than epsilon. So now I can move this over to this side and say that absolute value of x minus 4. If I multiply both sides by this, I'm going to have the square root, the square root of 3 plus 2 multiplied by epsilon. 
And this is a candidate for my delta. So it is either this is my delta, or I go back to that original claim that I made at the beginning, that one is my delta. Remember, the mission is to pick the smaller number. Which of these is smaller? Well, to you, it might look as if this is bigger than one. It's possible. But you always want to get the smaller version of it, okay? Something I didn't do in my other video that I did, but just looking at this, it appears this is smaller, but it depends on what epsilon is. What if epsilon is super tiny? It might end up being much smaller than one. So what we say is, we say that let delta be equal to the minimum of one and this. Okay, which is going to be rad 3 plus 2 multiplied by epsilon. Because we were able to find a delta, we're done with our proof. You don't need to re-substitute. You don't need to take it back and say no. So you just say, since we found a delta greater than 0, The proof is complete. Now, if you're taking Calc 1, I don't expect you to have this kind of a problem, okay? This is most relevant to advanced calculus. So, I hope this helped. I'll see you in the next video. Don't stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.